Should I just jump right in? Just yeah, we're, we're exactly on time. Perfect. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to the app competition uh, session. Uh, I hope this is your favorite session of the week, but if not, uh, I hope you enjoy it anyway. Um, we have a app competition that is now in its third year, uh, which invites developers from uh, all, all over the world, all different types of organizations to submit applications that they have developed. Uh, um, we then pick three finalists based on a set of criteria uh, that are announced uh, basically using the tools and building generic applications. Um, we select three finalists for two categories, Android and web applications. Those were announced on the community of practice in this um, post that you're seeing here on my screen uh, a few days ago. So hopefully all of you had a, had a chance to see the, the videos from those applications that were submitted. If you didn't, don't worry because each of those finalists will be presenting today. Uh, we have those six presentations. Each presenter will have six minutes exactly to tell you about their application. We will be a bit brutal in, in cutting everyone off at six minutes because we don't have a ton of time today. Um, and I posted a link also in the chat here on Zoom. Uh, please, if you do not have a Community of Practice account yet, please create one now because we will be using the Community of Practice to do our votes um, for the winner of this competition. And uh, yeah, so please create an account. We'll share the link to the voting um, uh, voting topic, which has a poll um, at the end of this session when the voting is opened. Um, note that there was a test um, a test poll that was created earlier that some of you were clever enough to find. Um, but that is a test poll, it does not count. So if you voted in the previous poll, please know that you will need to vote again when the uh, um, when the official poll is, is, is launched. Uh, and I'll share the link to that after all of the presenters have uh, had a chance to tell you about their great applications that they've built. And um, with that, I think I will turn it over to Deborah, who will introduce our web application finalists and allow them to uh, present for six minutes each. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Austin. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, like uh, Austin said, we have six finalists presenting their amazing applications. Um, and we would like to give them uh, the chance to present um, yeah, within uh, six minutes. So um, if you go over, please uh, forgive me in advance. I will uh, let you know. Um, and I am just going to, uh, yeah, sorry, share. Um, yes. Okay. So the first um, the first presentation uh, will be uh, I'm I'm presenting the category the web applications and then Jose will do the Android ones. And uh, so uh, the DHS two training app um, uh, by WHO Rochomo and ICT will be presented by Lucia Fernandez, and then route my user uh, by his South Africa. Uh, my team also, <laughs> and Amira Hamid, uh, and then the program that data set connector by BAO, BAO systems uh, by Pete uh, Linegan. So with that, I think uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lucia Fernandez, if you're ready uh, to share your screen, that will be great. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, everyone. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me properly? Yep. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm Lucia Fernandez and I'm going to be presenting the DHS2 training app on behalf of everyone in WHO who contributed to leading the development of this app, on behalf of ICT who developed the application, on behalf of uh, Lusomo who designed it in consultation with users from the ministries of health from within WHO and from partner institutions. And I hope everyone can switch on their cameras uh, and say hello, <laughs> everyone that has contributed to the application right now and during the presentation so that you can see uh, their faces. I'll share my screen right away. Um, so uh, the DHIS2 training app is an application uh, designed for the end users. So this application is designed to make the life of the end users sitting in health facilities and district health officers easier. So it provides to them uh, step-by-step -step tutorials on how to complete 
uh, data entry processes, data visualization processes that they have to complete. So let's imagine that I am uh, a district health officer that is sitting in a health facility or in a, in a district office and has to report monthly malaria data. I feel a little bit lost. I received training, DHS2 training long ago. I don't remember anymore where to go, which application in DHS2 to open, how to get to my phone and how to complete it. So now I can come into the menu of my DHS2 instance, uh, click on the training app, and the training app is going to ask me, what do I want to do today? What do I need to do today? Um, so uh, one of the options is going to be to enter data. So I will click on entering data, and I will be uh, displayed a tutorial on how to enter malaria monthly data. So once the user clicks on the tutorial, uh, the tutorial is going to take the user straight away to the DHIS2 application uh, where his data collection form lives. So once the user is here, he can start the tutorial. Uh, first, uh, he or she will see a summary of all the steps that he will have to complete uh, to enter data in his malaria monthly data collection form. Then he can start the tutorial and he will get in a screen on the right hand side with some gifts and some instructions showing him uh, where to click exactly to select the health facility, to select the data um, entry form, um, to select the period, he will have to be clicking next, 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 right? To select the period in there, uh, to complete, uh, select the data category, if anything, uh, then complete the data collection form by filling in the different data elements and use data dropdown menus if there are any, how to validate your data at the end by running validation and how to uh, um, correct the data if there is any mistakes and how to finally save and submit the form. So this will be telling him or her step-by-step step really where to click. By the time he finishes the DHS2 tutorial, he'll be congratulated for his effort and all the progress will be saved. Um, so if a user, for example, if, if training app is being used to provide um, a, a curriculum of training to end users and we're expecting them to follow different tutorials, their progress through each of these tutorials will be saved and you will see that later. Now, at the end of the tutorial, he or she will be reminded uh, of the steps uh, he took to complete this data entry process. And then the person can take another tutorial or go back to take the tutorial again if he's unsure or he wants to review it a little bit. Now, uh, this is great, but there is even better news. Uh, the DHS2 training app is also a tutorial builder. So we've built it in a way that is extremely flexible so that anybody uh, can create a custom tutorial for a custom data entry or data visualization process. So if we come into, into settings, into the configuration area of the app, we see that there is a list of tutorials uh, here at the bottom, and we can easily create another tutorial by clicking on plus and giving this tutorial a name. And I've got here some names that I've been saving. So a name, um, we can give this tutorial an icon. For example, uh, if it is a COVID tutorial, we can just find a COVID icon and give it an icon, we can indicate which versions of DHIS2 this tutorial is compatible with, and we can also link this tutorial with one of the DHIS2 applications. Then we can design a welcome page, and this is very easy because we get a preview of what the user is going to see when he or she comes into the tutorial. So we can start typing in here, seeing how things look like on for the user in the tutorial. Uh, then we can build all of the single steps in this tutorial. So we can, for example, uh, start one step, which can be called the selection of a vaccination point if we are creating a COVID vaccination tutorial. And we can create the contents of this step by creating a page where we can also type contents and we can get here a preview of the contents. And you can insert things like notes so that the users will be warned of certain things uh, at each of these steps. So once we have created all of the steps, uh, we can define which users can see these tutorials. And this is because we don't want to offer all tutorials to all users. We want users to be offered the tutorials that they really need to complete, the, to complete their data processes in the HIS2. So we can define here uh, who is going to see these uh, tutorials, and then we can go and save the tutorial. Now, this tutorial is now going to become available for us to plug it into the landing page because the landing page is also fully customizable. So you can change the landing page to fit uh, your use case or to fit the this data design in your country and data processes in your country. 
So I just open the landing page, the different pages that users go through when they land into the DHIS2 training app. And I'm going to insert this tutorial in one of them. So I'm going to insert it, for example, here, daily COVID vaccinations. Um, I'll click on save. And now if I go back to the interface that the users will see, I see that after clicking on entering data, I can see my daily COVID data vaccination tutorial. So my new tutorial that I just built very quickly and very easily is available immediately for my end users uh, to follow. Just two more really good news. Uh, one is that you can translate the tutorials in any languages by coming into the three dots next to the tutorial, exporting a JSON of translations, and you can you get a JSON file uh, that I'll show you on the screen that you can translate in any language, and then you can import uh, this text by coming into here, importing translation, uh, choosing the translations, and assigning the translations to the specific tutorials. And the second really good piece of news is that you can export tutorials and import them, the whole tutorial, into a different DHIS2 instance. So any tutorials, for example, if a country has started collect, uh, using DHIS2 for COVID vaccinations and has developed a great tutorial, that they want to say, uh, share with another country, they can come to the three dots, uh, export the module, and this uh, zip file can be imported into any, um, any application, any DHIS2 training app implementation by essentially dragging and dropping there. Now it exists, it's not gonna be imported, but you can simply drag and drop the tutorial and you will get it into your list of tutorials ready to be inserted anywhere on your landing page as I showed before. So uh, this is all for me. I want to again highlight that this has been a collaborative effort that we've been designing this application thanks to Lusomo in collaboration with uh, users from ministries of health, from WHO regional offices and country offices and partners like RPI and CHAI who can now maybe switch on their screens and, and show their faces. And um, with uh, ICT has uh, done the development of the application and WHO has been leading it. So we really hope this is gonna help um, end users from these health facilities and district offices uh, use DHIS2 in, a, in an easier way, find it easier to, to enter data and to visualize data in DHIS2. So I hope you like it and I hope you vote for us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucia. Thank you so much. With that, we're going to uh, go over to uh, HIPS South Africa with Rob, my user. I think Amira is going to start, I'm not sure, but uh, go ahead and feel free to share your screen. Thank you, Deborah, and good afternoon, everyone from HISP South Africa. My name is Amira Hamid. I am joined by my very talented colleague and developer of this really cool app that we're going to share with you today, Mueti Mposo. And we, we've been thinking about user experience as being such a critical factor in the adoption of digital health and know that DHIS is so widely used and wanted to contribute to enhancing the user experience on DHIS instances and programs. So the Root My User app helps you customly root users, different types of users. Many of these programs have lots of different users and maybe they struggle to navigate to where they need the functionality or the modules that they need to land on because they are low tech users or because there's so many different aspects on the, the instance itself that it just will save time if they could land directly on the, the functionality that they need. So this app allows you to set up these routes. You can do it to a custom landing page uh, or a custom URL, a DHIS module, or even a custom web app that you have loaded up onto your DHIS instance. And we've tested and run this on 2.32 and above. Amoyeti is going to talk to you about how we do the installation, how simple and easy it is to set up your routing. Over to you, Amoyeti. Thanks, Amira. Uh, and as Amira has already mentioned for the demo, I'm going to talk about how to install and set up the landing page app, how to configure different landing pages, and then show how the app actually works. All right. Uh, one more thing: the app is the app package is available in a public repository on GitLab. So to install the app. You load the app package in DHIS2 app management, uh, like so. The, the app is already installed on my instance. Uh, this is the one, the landing page app. 
And then after uploading the package, you then set the, the landing page app as your default app in system settings. So you go to system settings, appearance, and then set the start page as your, the, the landing page app as your start page, which is already done in my, in my instance. After that, you want to make sure that uh, you, you give all your users access to the app in user role settings so that they can be rooted uh, when they when they when they log in also done here in my in my instance once your app is set up you can go to the app once your app is set up you can go to the apps admin page to configure some routes. Uh, during setup, a, a default start page is also added by default. This is set up to redirect all the users accessing your instance to, to, the, to the dashboard. This default start page can, can also be updated. Um, so this is the, 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 the one that says default start page. I have already gone ahead and set up two other landing pages. Um, one is a, 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 a landing page that routes users to, to a, a, a web app that's installed in app management. And then another is, is a, an app that routes users to, to a custom URL. Um, let's see how to add a, a, a new landing page. So we press the add new button, then fill the page creation form. Provide the name, which is a required field. Um, we will create a landing page that routes users to, to the data entry capture app for the demo. Um, data, let's call it data entry. You can provide the description, which is optional. And then you select the app type as Amira already mentioned. The landing page app can redirect your users to three different types of apps in DHIS2. Uh, it can be any web app that's installed in app management. So you will select the app and then uh, select the specific app here. So a list of all the installed apps will show up in this uh, in this entry. Uh, it can also root users to DHIS2 modules, meaning a, a pre-installed core app, such as data capture app, data visualizer, maps apps, and the rest. To do that, you'll select DHIS2 module, and then the selection will show a list of all the DHIS2 um, modules. You can also route your users to a custom URL that should be resolvable within your DHIS2 instance, instance such as uh, a standard report or a specific favorite. So for this one, we said we are using data entry, so we'll select DHIS2 module and then select the, um, our data entry. Then after that, you can select your users. Let's select um, Traore, Alain for this. You can add as many users as you want to your route. You can also select user groups, meaning rather than selecting individual users, if you have a, a group that uh, uh, is a group of all your data captures, then you can select that specific. Uh, user group. All right, after that, you select save. And then you'll have your roots. All right, let's now look at how our roots. We have one minute. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We have one let's minute. look at how our roots will, will, will look like. Okay, so first I'll log in as um, Traore, who we just set up to be rooted to to the data capture app. So immediately when they log in, they are rooted to the data entry screen. Let's log out and try another user still on the same instance. So let's try 
DDA, Conan still on the same instance. Password. So this user will be routed to a standard report, our ANC report. Now let's try a final uh, root of the diff of the custom app. Let's try Bombali. And then the there's end. user. Hello? Bombali. Sorry, my dear, we are, if we're wrapping up, that would be, uh, that would be great just to um, give the, the, the other finalists the opportunity to also present. Mm, actually, Dan, that user is rooted to, 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 to the data quality app. Uh, thank you, and that's it, our simple routing app to redirect users to different pages within the HIS2. Thank you from our team. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Marty. So then um, when you're ready, uh, Pete, um, then you can present the program data set connector by VAO systems. Hello, can uh, everybody hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, yeah, welcome to this quick presentation on the Program Dataset Connector app. Uh, it's kind of a solo project uh, that was started at the beginning of the year, um, and it's used for creating the metadata that you need to transfer data from the tracker to the aggregate data models, and also to be able to apply custom disaggregations to program indicators. So I'm just going to go through a quick um, configuration that I've already set up and uh, see how it can be used. So here we have the program indicator that we want to disaggregate in patient cases. Um, we're on the app page already here. And as a simple table where you can uh, filter and sort the mappings. Um, but we're going to go ahead and edit this one. So there's not a huge number of fields that the user needs to select to set up the mapping. You basically select where you want to send the data to. So that's the data set and the data element and where you want the source of the data to come from on the tracker side. So that's the program indicator. And then the app, it looks at all the category options associated with the data set and data element and it creates this table here. Um, and then the user basically fills out these filter fields to specify how the total program indicator should be broken down um, for the specified category option. So in this case, to filter inpatient cases by age 0 to 19, uh, we're checking the age data element has a value greater than or equal to 0 and less than 20. And similarly, for all the other disaggregations that um, we have applied to this data set and data element. And what we do, uh, what the app does when we click generate mapping, uh, which I've done already, is it will go through and look at all the category combos assigned to that data set and data element and look at all those category option filters um, that have been specified. And it goes ahead and it combines them for us uh, to create program indicators for all the valid combinations. So you can see here we have uh, 70 program indicators have been generated and that's for the two gender groups, uh, the five age groups and the seven weight groups. So if we have a quick look in one of these, we can see uh, we've got the original program indicator has been modified to add the category options that it's disaggregating. Um, there's a few Oh, sorry, I should be in program indicators here, but it's the same uh, concept in patient cases. We've got the category option names here. And then the key thing that the app has done is in the filter, it's automatically appended filters for that category combo breakdown. Um, female between 0 and 20 and weight greater than 100. And then the next thing the app does is it creates uh, indicators which do 
they hold the program indicator in their numerator and their denominator is one. Then they have these additional fields uh, for the category option combo, which is represented by this breakdown. Uh, the attribute option combo, which would relate to any disaggregations on the data set. And it creates a custom attribute called the uh, event aggregate mapping. And it puts the data element ID um, for our mapping in this field. And all this means is when we export this data, instead of getting the indicator UID out, we actually get the data element UID with the correct disaggregations assigned to it. And that means we can take our tracker program indicator data and convert it um, into aggregate data. So the last thing that the app makes is uh, an indicator group, which holds all of our um, generated indicators and also includes URL, which we can put into our browser, add a period and um, an organization unit dimension and get that transformed data out uh, into the aggregate data model. And I think I might have enough time to do this quickly. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so we have our URL and then we add an example uh, period for last month and particular org unit. And you can see the data is now being transformed from program indicators into aggregate data elements with the correct disaggregations. Um, so that means when we go to the data entry screen, um, so we did our mapping for though, the data for the program indicator has been mapped onto uh, this aggregate data set with all the powerful disaggregations, which means we can do things um, with program indicators like break them down by uh, custom disaggregations. And that can be whatever, uh, that's my alarm saying that time. Uh, the <laughs> disaggregations can be whatever you want. So it's fully customizable in that respect. So that's the PDAC app. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was great uh, timing. And uh, now, uh, yes, so now I I'm going to turn it over to Jose to present the uh, Android applications, the finalists. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so let me very quick um, share my screen to introduce you the, uh, the finalists for Android. Okay, here we go. I think that I hope you can uh, you can see my screen. So uh, also thank you for all the uh, a lot for all the participants for the time that you have dedicated uh, to participate in this uh, Android app competition. So we have three. Uh, first of all, it's going to be Amber Sit uh, from PSI, who is a senior technical advisor, who is going to present the routine data quality assessment or RDQA Android tool. Then we also have uh, Sheila Gabriel uh, from South Digitus, uh, who is the uh, implementer, imp implementation lead. Uh, and he's, she's going to present the certificate validator app. And then we also have uh, Joseph Chingalo uh, from his Tanzania, who is going to present the Meta, Metadata Explorer app. So Amber, uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. As you remember that you have uh, six minutes. Thanks. I can't share my. I'm going to take over sharing. Okay, thanks, Jose. I think you can hear me. Uh, my name is Amber Sheets, uh, like Jose said, from the Digital Health and Team at Population Services International. So I'm demoing for you today um, a fork uh, DHIS2 Android app for routine data quality assessments. So, as we know, DHIS2 is being around, used around the world and over. 90 health information systems being used for COVID surveillance, uh, vaccines, DHIS2 for education, and then we have so many donors and partners using DHIS2. So that's a lot of data. 
Um, and we shouldn't stop looking at our data once it's been entered, synced, and reported. So it's critical that we follow through and ensure the data we have in these systems is accurate and that we're in supporting corrective steps to um, continuously monitor and ensure we build capacity and support the teams that are creating health impact. Um, in most settings, uh, ME teams, so when we go out and we conduct audits, we're using paper-based, Excel-based tools to conduct these audits, which makes going through those massive Ministry of Health books and then additional paper forms. And then you also have your laptop um, and your charger in a tiny room with, there's probably only one table. So you've got all this stuff. And then now with physical distancing, we need more options to keep up with the data quality of what we're entering into DHIS2. So this app was built as a fork of 2.1 um, through collaboration with uh, PSI, UIO, and um, partners. Uh, two of the features are actually now um, in 2.4, and only the rich text features and our feedback loop are still unique to this fork. Um, so I've already opened um, one of the three stages. It's the systems assessment. Um, so once you um, register your enrollment, uh, it opens straight into your system assessment. And so you can see we have um, the color coding for legend sets based on our, our questions here. Um, so you can go through and conduct your systems assessment. This is done once per RDQA. It allows you to report the qualitative um, status and strengths and weaknesses of your point of care or your service delivery site that you are reviewing. Um, next is our data verification stage. Um, so this you can conduct for as many indicators as you want. As you can tell, I've, I've filled it in already for this. So I've looked at the HTS TST indicator, which we all probably know from the uh, PEPFAR MER. Um, and again, we're going through the standard, all of the questions around standard m &E tools that we all know. Um, and like I mentioned with physical distancing, we also have, we've leveraged the opportunity to upload um, documents. And so here you can see I've uploaded some really important data. Um, so that way, if anyone wants to review this audit as well from the head office, and so we can minimize people in the field, um, we, can, can, we can upload as well. So after you conduct all of your data assessments, so however many indicators you have, I conducted an assessment for HTS, TST, and also our, the TX new ART indicator. You can look at the indicator tab, and here you can see we've used, um, we've populated with indicators to actually so standard m &E indicators with the legend sets as well. So we can quickly see where teams are doing well and not so well, and where they need improvement. And then I'm going to click the feedback tab. And so here again, you can see this is um, where we're able to now give that continuous feedback directly to the to the teams as we see their score straight away. Normally, when you conduct an RDQA, you take all this data, you've got it on a piece of paper, you got it on your Excel, you need to go back to your office, sit down, put it all together, and actually get these data points out and do the calculations at your desk. And then maybe they'll get the, the report in a couple of weeks time if you're lucky. And so this actually lets us give feedback to the sites right away. How are they doing on these indicators? We can focus on failed and you can see we've got it by indicator. So we've got again that HTS TSD indicator and also the TX new indicator. So we can quickly give feedback. Once we've looked at those indicator results and the feedback, then we can actually do the last stage, which is our action plan. So here I've filled out um, two different action plans already um, based on feedback that I saw from this audit. One was around data editing. Um, so here again, we can see, you can put in um, the key action item, status, um, long text, um, who's responsible for it and timelines. And so this allows us to really close the loop and make sure that not only are we making sure the data quality is of top notch, but also that we're going back and we're supporting our sites and we're documenting this. So thanks so much. And thanks again for PSI, our partners, um, to making this, this app a reality. Great. Thank you, Amber. Uh, also, less than five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, uh, our next uh, participant is Sheila from Saudigitus. Uh, are you ready to share your screen? Yes. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Sheila. I'm uh, Josette, can you confirm if you're seeing my screen? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. So my name is Sheila from East Mozambique uh, for Digitus. Um, I'm here to present um, everybody uh, the, the certificate up. I will just brief have um, a brief contextualization about uh, what made us uh, made this this app. So um, COVID brought um, a lot of change challenge, and one of them was uh, for the travels. So the travels need to have uh, laboratory tests that were negative. So for that, we we we. We, we made a portal that was uh, used to schedule a laboratory test and also the same the same portal it's used to print these uh, results. Um, a travel must go and collect a sample and after the, the sample is ready uh, an SMS is sent to the travel and he with uh, a code that he can go to the portal and see the, the, the laboratory test result. I will show um, the here, the portal. So we have here the portal, we have uh, many other options, but we are focused here at uh, consult the result. If we click um, here in the results, we have uh, this, 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 this page, who you have to enter the phone number and also the reference that were sent by SMS, and you'll be able to, to print to print the certificate. I already printed the certificate in order to facilitate because we only have six minutes, but I will show here the same registration in the in the in the DHS instance that were also entered here. Okay, so. Let me show you the, how the app works. We have here the app, uh, a tail report. Uh, there is stuff that have this, uh, this, this app. This is basically to confirm if the certificate that the personal, the travel uh, brought to the airport, if it's fake or, uh, or uh, a valid uh, certificate. Here we can enter the the user. So uh, we have entry here to the app. Uh, we have uh, the certificate validation option and we also have uh, passengers options. Uh, the passengers options allow the travel to uh, have a pre-registration -regist if it's arrived uh, at the airport. But uh, we will be focused here on the certificate validation. How it works. So uh, the airport staff uh, can click on certificate validation. And here we have uh, two options. One, you can scan uh, the, the, the certificate uh, by the care code, or we have um, an option to entering the, the, the unique ID that it's uh, present on the certificate. Uh, we, I can show you the two options. I will use first the scan, the care code. Uh, this is an example. Uh, travel can bring at home and then we can scan. And after we scan the, we have here all the, the information from the same patient. We can confirm here we have uh, the name of a beta. And we have also the gender, age, uh, phone number and address. And uh, the, the test details that confirms that is negative. Uh, we also can do the same thing uh, by searching uh, from the code. I can enter here the code. Okay. And I can search. Uh, this is an example. If I entering um, a wrong code, it will say that certificate is not found. 
Uh, maybe I just failed here. Let me check. Okay, it's missing here. 19. Okay. And we have here searched by, by the unit code that the certificate is valid and we have also the same the same here the same information um okay so we have here also the the same results uh from the app we only have uh this 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 these options uh and this is where we uh, wanted to present, and I will, uh, and I want to say uh, a thank you for for the South Digital team, the East Mozambique, special for the developers uh, team. Uh, for us, it's that. Thank you. So, bye. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, really cool. So next time I go to the airport, I will be checking if someone is is using your app. Um, okay, our next participant, uh, Joseph Chigalo, he's going to present an app that he has developed as part of the work of the work that he has been doing with uh, participating in the Android Developer Workshop. So, Joseph, whenever you're ready, you have six minutes. And hello, it's Joseph here. Hopefully, everybody can see the screen. Yes, we so, can see. Yeah. Present, because the idea is just, uh, as it is being mentioned, is just, just, just to metadata explorer, a mobile app. This is practically how, how the idea um, in my mind is as, as you know, not technical users. They, Try to try to get it for the regimented data, but no, it's through API, it's no, no possible for technical users, but for non-technical non users, some of it's difficult for, for users to at least to, to go to navigate across the limited data. Or if you go, if you are using maintenance of the web one to data set, but to just list the data element, but you don't know the related metadata. What type of data set the terms are responsible to a given data set is wrong with other options given data sets. So the idea has come up at least to a, a GUI such as data across all metadata, the related metadata from given resource. Joseph, sorry, sorry. That, whatever uh, cannot, they do. Sorry, Joseph, we cannot see your screen. Uh, well, we can see, but uh, we cannot see your more. Okay, it's coming. Okay, yeah, you were like, yeah, sorry, sorry. Over. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 So the app, of course, I will just always just giving the small detail how the idea comes from. So from the app perspective, so I try to open the app. So just like a mobile app, you have to address to a given instance, you log in on the instance, they try to pull all the metadata through this button here to think the metadata. So once you have all metadata on offline, so you can try to just transfer through different metadata. So I tried to mimic a so from web APIs. So as you can see for now, we support some metadata. So some tour of some of the metadata. So such as just for four programs. So as you can see, I give the number here as number 33. Programs from the instance that I've been logging. So what we try to try to read to view what is uh, what uh, the metadata program metadata that are uh, belong to. As you can see, there are a number of metadata, program metadata. So if I want to transverse through one of the metadata, yeah, try to, to start with smart with Maria for investigation, which is a tracker based model, tracker based program. So once I open the metadata, as you can see, I get I get some little at least names UID in some of the fields that are currently supported, at least from from metadata. As you can see, it's related metadata to the given program, which is a tracker. You can see the program attribute, program stage, as well as program indicator. So if I intended at least to view the latent, let's say program attribute, 
So I go to the program attributes, as you can see. If I click it, it will pop out all the attributes that respond to the given program. So if I were intended to at least to, to get back to a given attribute, let's say I want to the area for locations, I click it, I did, it provides some more information on the given program output. As well, if it was a possible option set, it will provide me with a list of option sets so I can go and try to get to, to view what are the other metadata concerning the given option set. Let's say I go to the first one, one to two kilometer. So once I go there, it, it provides more detail to see what it is, the name and the code, as well as the options exactly that the option will belong to. So this is one way at least you can transverse through the program. I can go back at least to a view of another program. Let's say we see the program for the tracker base. So I can go another program, let's say the one which is which is event-based. So let's say we try to use impatient mobility and mobility mortality. So one is isolated. As you know, event-based, so we don't let any data so far as just program stage and as well as program indicator. So let's say I can go to program indicator. I want to try to do what indicators that are related to this program. So once I select it, I, it provides the list of all the program indicators that have been associated to a given uh, this program. If I want to view at least the metadata within the, this given program, program indicator, so I go and try to click, let's say, how do I get for the death? So once I open it, it tried to provide me a CUID name, which have been set to the system, was there some expression, as well as the filter if it's variable, as well as if, if the, this program indicator is intended to be displayed on the tracker base app. So it's somehow at least you can navigate across different metadata. Let's say I want, for this year, I want to view the program series that are responsible for this given program. So once I select it, it provides for this event base. So it's just one program. So that led me on event based event info page. So as you can see, there are a lot of information there, as well as the risk of all the associated with given data, given program study. If I intended to preview more of that element, the metadata. So let's say gender, I want to go to the gender and it provide me at least with some basic information for concerns the data element, this data element, mm -hmm. as well as option, related options that have been assigned if the inner. So if I want to go to navigate across the option, I can, let's say mirror. If I open up, it provide me the more information about the options that have been selected. So let's say I want to try to get back on to, to, to try to navigate back on other metadata, let's say data sets. So I'll pick one of the data sets. It provides risk of all the data sets that have been available to me from a given instance. Let's say Joseph, pick you only have 30 picks. more seconds, okay? You, you, you need to get finished. 30 more seconds, sorry. Okay, okay. So the same way as you can just navigate to all the way forward, as you can. Data that's with help of core team for Android, that is most for SDK team. I've been working, I've been working on them, at least to incorporate more, more, more metadata as, as I can. So, for if you intend to use this source app, if you can go and come into practice with this focus that I've been running to you, it's the DHS2 metadata explorer. As you can see, on the end, you can get, get some source code of the app, as well as some list of APKs that the release of APKs that have been posted so far. But I know when the release of the release direct on, on the That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, for all your hard work also in the uh, Android uh, dev uh, workshop. So I think that the uh, Austin, uh, I think that the floor is yours now with the voting process. Yes, so we will be posting in just one moment the link to the uh, community of practice post with a poll for uh, voting on the winner for the two categories that we have this year. That is the Android category and the web application category. So I'll be posting that link now into the chat here in Zoom. You will have uh, five minutes to uh, maybe three minutes to go to that post and vote for your favorite Android and web application. Uh, and once that 
the three minutes is up. We will close the poll and uh, tally the votes. You will then be able to see the winner uh, in, in that community practice poll as well. So you can see the votes that were received and uh, we will announce the winner as well. Um, I'd also like to share that the uh, winner will receive a sponsored uh, um, uh, attendance to one of our in-person developer academies that will be coming up uh, once, once in-person academies are, are, are possible again in the world we live in um, uh, and possibly some other uh, uh, bonus prizes as well that we'll talk about um, maybe after the fact. Um, but the, and, and they'll also receive a badge on the community of practice uh, to show that they were a winner for the 2021 uh, app competition. Um, it, Gassim uh, has shared the link to that, um, uh, that poll on the community of practice in the, uh, in the chat. So please, everyone, uh, you have three minutes to go to that link uh, and vote on the, uh, the winner. I will share my screen so that we can see what that looks like. Um, and we will have a winner in just a few minutes. It looks like our votes are already rolling in. We have uh, yeah, lots of votes coming in for both the categories, web app and Android. Remember that everyone can vote for one winner in each of the categories. You can vote for one Android application and one web application. Uh, and uh, it's great to see uh, all of this participation. So um, we will have two minutes left to, uh, to tally your votes. Please make sure that you are, are, are voting um, and then we will uh, announce the winner very shortly. This is a point in time when Scott asked us to play some music, but unfortunately <laughs> we can't violate copyrights. We can't play popular music here. We'll get in trouble with YouTube. But if anyone wants to produce some open source music for us for next year, you know, we could have a good DHS2 annual app competition jingle we can play in the background. Uh, that would be, you know, I think, a I think we addition. should. <laughs> I think we should. We should just uh, beatbox some music as we as we uh, uh, accompany everyone voting here. <laughs> Very uh, nice. yeah, thought, anyone else oh, would like to contribute as well? That's a very, that's a very <laughs> Baroque big box you have there. Right. Thank you. That was not a big box. I, I mean, <laughs> and as, as, you're, as we're seeing in the chat, I know there are a lot of um, musicians in the DHS2 team. So maybe next year we just have to perform our own music live for the, the, the voting old music. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I just want to say while, while we have everyone's attention here and, every, and those votes are coming in, we have one minute left. Um, the, the quality of the applications and the presentations this year are, are really amazing across the board. All six of these applications on web and, app, and Android are really great to, great to see uh, and really show the, the growth of the developer community and the community of DHS2 as a whole. So really excited to see all of these submissions. There were also many submissions that didn't make it as finalists because they were also so high quality. Um, you can find out more about some of those on the community of practice as well, and be sure to check them out. They were all worthy applications. It was really hard to make the decision for the, the top three in each of these categories. And oh, also a good time like to, maybe a good time to plug your developer uh, events too. I know that you guys have been organizing bi-weekly meetups. I think I heard from the Android team they're also gonna be starting to do something some more. Yeah, Deborah, do you wanna share a little bit about that? Yes, yes. So we, we are organizing um, bi-weekly meetups or um, online meetings for the developer community every two weeks or at least twice a month, um, that's uh, ideally. And uh, we would like to have Android topics as well. Um, in addition to the uh, web app topics that we have been having uh, for the past uh, months. So you're welcome to join. Um, please just uh, uh, keep an eye out on, uh, on that community of practice or on Slack, uh, the, the workspace that I will share uh, a link in the, uh, in the chat where you can join also the DHIS2 developer community workspace or Slack workspace. Um, to find out when the next uh, meetup will take place. Uh, and yeah, you're, you're welcome to join on Invited, the developer community, please uh, come. And uh, it'd be great to, to meet you all. 
Great. I think we'll close the voting here in just one moment. Um, I think Kasim will go ahead and close, close the poll so we can see the results here for who won each of these categories. Um, thank you, Deborah, for sharing the, the developer meetups. And uh, I also want to point everyone who is a developer or wants to uh, build an application and maybe isn't a developer yet to uh, share what you're, what you're working on or what you'd like to see built on the community of practice, as well as visit the developers.dhs2.org resources. So here we go. I am refreshing my page and we have quite a few votes for both of these, oh, wow, it is neck and neck for the Android application. Um, but the Android application winner for the 2021 application development competition is going to be the RDQA app by PSI. So congratulations to that team and to Amber for uh, the Android application. We also have a winner from the web app by, by a, a bit of a landslide here. Um, and that is the DHS2 training app by WHO, Lushomo and ICT. And so those congratulations to both of those winners and both of those teams, as well as to all of our finalists, really great submissions across the board, uh, as well as everyone else who submitted to the, the, the competition this year. Uh, competition was pretty fierce and we, we were talking about it that we, we might need to add some additional categories uh, to be able to, to, to see more of these uh, awesome innovations going forward. Uh, thank you. Very much to everyone. Um, if, if everyone would like to give congratulations to the winners and the finalists, um, uh, please uh, send a reaction or, or in the chat now. Uh, and with that, I think we will wrap up the, uh, the session and uh, get ready for the closing session, which will begin in four minutes. Thank you to everyone involved in this competition.